Alex and Andrew. All right, hi everyone. It's lovely to virtually see everyone today. We're gonna to be giving you guys a bit of a talk about ticks and the diseases they carry. Um, so yeah, I'm, Al I'm Alex, this is Andrew. To the next slide. So just to give you a brief outline of the talk, we're gonna cover kind of who we are and what we do in our lab before moving on to kind of the basics of ticks and arthropods, such as their life cycle and what they carry. It's not gonna be a super in-depth dive into everything because we would be here for a week but hopefully it'll be enough to kind of give you guys a really good basics. And then finally, we're also gonna talk about tick prevention. I know you guys probably have heard everything that we're gonna say before, but everything always bears worth repeating. So to introduce who we are, uh, this is the Brennan Lab. We're quite a small little research group. Mazzy is our postdoc, uh, Ben is our PI, so our principal investigator. He kind of runs the lab and looks after all of us. I'm a second year PhD student. I'll soon be moving into my third year. And Andrew is in his first year of his PhD. So what we're really interested in in our lab is we're really interested in viruses which are carried by ticks and spread by ticks. So we use a variety of different techniques in the lab to investigate these, such as cell lines, uh, we've actually just established our own live tick colony, so we'll be moving into doing things in these organisms. And then we complement both of these with doing a bunch of different molecular biology techniques. The specific techniques we use are varied depending on the questions we want to answer. Overall, we really want to understand kind of what are, why are these viruses spread by ticks uh, as opposed to any other kind of insect? What does this virus have to do to replicate inside a tick and how does it manage to replicate without actually killing the tick? And these are quite big questions. So the way that we break these down and the way that we answer them is by doing a lot of experiments to answer kind of smaller questions that will help us create a bigger picture and a better understanding. And so my PhD focuses on kind of the main first question and I'm looking at why and what allows these viruses to be carried by ticks. Whereas Andrew? Yeah, I'm focusing on the mechanisms that the virus employs itself um, that allows them to affect not only the ticks, but also humans. Um, so what really are ticks? Well, they're not what you see in this um, terrible film, terrible, wonderful film, and also this TV show. Um, one other thing that ticks are not, and that is they are not, spoiler alert, insects. Ticks are arthropods, not insects, but share common characteristics with insects, such as an exoskeleton, a segmented body, and a joint appendages. Um, like spiders and mites and scorpions, ticks are arachnids. Ticks feed on the blood of vertebrates um, externally, hence they are called ectoparasites. They have four different life stages, as shown by the image on the right. That is egg, um, larva, nymph, and adult. Although um, there are three families of, of ticks, the main one we're interested in is the Exotidae um, family, also known as the hard shell, um, ticks, hard shell ticks, as um, this is the family you're most likely to run into here in the UK. And ticks are also carriers of quite a few um, pathogens that can cause illness in both humans and animals, but we'll talk about that more later in the talk. So first of all, let's play a little game just to show you how small and um, difficult ticks are to spot. Can you spot anything interesting here about this muffin? So give everyone a couple of seconds. Yeah. So not all the poppy seeds here are as they seem. Five of them are actually Ixodes nymphs. Um, hopefully we haven't put you off any of the snacks you're eating at the moment here, um, but yeah. So in the UK, we actually have quite a few different species of tick. However, you won't tend to encounter most of them because they tend to parasitize very specific species and so they'll keep out the way of people. The most common type of tick that you will encounter is the deer tick, also known as Ixodus ricinus. Um, but there are a couple of others such as the hedgehog tick, the British dog tick, the red sheep tick, and the ornate cow tick, alongside the brown dog tick. All of these guys are hard shell ticks but they all have a bit of a different look about them. And I just wanna point out something about the brown dog tick. So unlike the five on the other five on this slide, the brown dog tick isn't actually native to the UK. It was only introduced a while back, um, probably through pet transport or travel. And unlike the rest of these ticks on the board, 
which can't really live inside people's houses. If you, trend, if you tend to take one into your house, it will die in a couple of days. The brown dog tick is actually pretty happy setting up shop in people's homes. So it's quite worrying, but also it's a really good example of how ticks are continuing to expand their territories. So how long do ticks live? Well, it might not please everyone, but tends to be quite a while sometimes. They've got three main life stages once they've hatched, which is the larva, nymph, and adult. You can have adult males and adult females. There is a bit of a difference between the two. As you can see, females tend to be quite a bit larger and also morphologically or aesthetically, they look quite different. Uh, ticks can actually live up to, it takes them about two years to get to the adult stage of life. But if they continue to find blood meals, they can actually live for up to four years. And to get to every next stage, they do need to take a blood meal in order to shed and move on. So from say a larva to a nymph and then a nymph to an adult. Now to find these blood meals, ticks exhibit a behavior known as questing. And this is where they climb up either long grass or foliage, roughly to about the height of the hosts that they want to latch onto. And then they stick out their two front legs. Now this has two main purposes. The first purpose is to detect hosts through sensing breath or CO2, odor, body heat and vibrations through organs in their front legs, which are known as Haller's organs. And additionally, once they're in this position, it's a really, really great and easy way to just latch onto whatever hosts are passing by. But once they're latched on, it can actually take between 10 minutes and four hours to tip for ticks to then bite. And to bite, they have a couple of different things that help them out. To grip on to make sure that they don't go anywhere while they're getting they're hunkering down, they've got these tiny little leg hairs all across their legs and also clumped at the end of their legs to form claws, which help them grip onto hosts. In terms of their mouth, once they start to bite, they have two stabilizing palps on the outside, which don't actually pierce the skin. They spread out like stabilizers to help keep the tick in place so that the inner part of the mouth, the hypostone and chalicera can access the bloodstream. So the chalicera act like two little knives cutting into the skin to give the hypostone, which is almost a straw-like structure, access to the bloodstream so it can essentially suck up your blood through a straw. The hypostome is also barbed, which means that it's really easy to hold it, the tick in place. And ticks can secrete saliva, which contains a, um, anesthetic and cementing factors to make sure that everything stays in place while they take their meal. So once they start to take this meal, um, the larvae usually do this for two to four days, while nymphs do this for four to six days. And adults have been recorded to feed for up to 10 days before becoming fully engorged. During this feeding process, um, a tick can actually expand up to 200 times its original volume. Um, so now onto the fun part of our talk, the different things ticks can carry. But before we go into this section, we do want to note that this is not intended to scare anyone. As it stands, these things are very, very rare to come across, um, but it's always very good to be aware. Um, ticks can carry a whole host of pathogens, some of which are able to cause disease in humans, such as bacteria, parasites, and toxins. Even when the tick isn't carrying anything, certain tick species, their bites have been known to trigger an alpha-gal reaction in the unlucky people to be bitten, which may cause them to have an allergy to red meat. And of course, um, ticks also carry our favorite viruses. But we save, we're gonna save that until last as we go into more detail um, of the other examples here on the board. So the first one is Lyme's disease. So when we say tick-borne diseases, the most thing, the most people think of Lyme's disease and we wouldn't blame you for that as Lyme disease is the most common tick-borne infection in the Northern Hemisphere. And it's also endemic um, to part, most parts of the UK. Um, Lyme's disease is caused by the bacterium Borrelia and is carried by the, the deer tick. As we mentioned before, it is the most common tick type to be found in the UK. And the initial um, symptoms of Lyme disease are uh, flu-like, such as fever, headache, and um, stiff muscles. And the earlier it is caught, the more easy it is to treat with antibiotics. Um, the disease is also associated with the development of a bullseye rash around the tick bite site. However, this rash only occurs in about uh, one to three people, one in three people who are infected with Lyme disease, which is why it is important to see your GP after you get bitten by a tick and if you feel unwell, even if you don't have a rash. So if left untreated, or if there's other factors involved, such as the person being immunocompromised, um, Lyme disease can develop in severity. 
So after um, the initial infection, um, which can last up, um, up, to two, up to a month, stage two involves the bacterium spreading out from the initial um, infection site to other organs, um, which increases the likelihood of the bacterium infecting the heart, the musculoskeletal system, and the nervous system. If the infection continues, it can um, lead to encephalitis and meningitis, um, which both lead to neurological complications and arthritis. So although Lyme's disease is, as we said, by far the most well-known pathogen, it's not the only bacterium that ticks are capable of carrying. We're also quickly going to give some other examples of pathogens um, that cause disease in humans before specifically going in detail about viruses. So our ba another bacterial example is anaplasmosis, which is a bacterium that can cause the disease human granul granulitic anaplasmosis, where the bacterium attacks the blood's immune cells. Although there have been some recorded deaths due to this disease, most people who are infected with the bacterium will get at most a mild flu-like symptoms, um, but unfortunately for a few unlucky patients, the disease can cause more severe outcomes such as respiratory failure, bleeding problems and organ failure over a longer period of time. So as we said, ticks are also able to carry parasites. Babesiosis is caused by the protozoan parasite Babesia, which is a malaria-like parasite that attacks the red blood cells. Babesia is transmitted primarily by a relative of the deer tick, Ixidus scapularis, which is found across the Northeast and Upper Midwest USA. And that's therefore where this parasite tends to be very common and affects many more people. As seen with previous, um, pathogens that we've mentioned, many people who are infected with this parasite will likely experience no symptoms or at most, again, mild flu-like symptoms such as fever, anemia, chills and sweats. Symptoms again occur around one to four weeks after first being bitten um, by an infected tick and if left untreated can last for several months. And finally, we're going on to the fun bit, the viruses. Most of these viruses we, would we wouldn't blame you for never having heard of. Pretty much all of these viruses are found across the seas in other places that aren't the UK. Uh, in our lab, as we said, we focus on the order Bunivirales, which encompasses many different families of viruses, quite a few of which have the potential to cause quite nasty diseases. But there are other families of virus that ticks can carry that also have some quite devastating outcomes, as we're showing on the board. So to mention one or two in a bit more detail, we're first going to talk about TBEV, which is tick-borne encephalitis virus. There are three types of TBEV, which are named roughly after their rough geographical distributions, the Western European, Eastern or Siberian, and Far Eastern subtypes. Uh, the distribution of the ticks which carry these diseases corresponds to where you can find them. And alongside humans, many other animals can be infected. But in most people, the symptoms usually include mild fever and other flu-like symptoms, but can develop to a more severe condition involving the central nervous system and leading to meningitis, encephalitis, or in some cases, both. In cases where the central nervous system is involved, about 1-2% to of patient uh, cases will result in death. And tick-borne encephalitis virus is a great, but probably more scary, example of pathogens being carried by ticks and expanding into new territories. As the map shows on the top right, this virus is usually found further afield. However, in 2020, the first isolation and actual case of TBEV was found in England. Factors such as expansion of the human population, travel, and definitely climate change have caused ticks to expand their territory. And often this means they take the pathogens they carry with them. And unfortunately, once these pathogens get into new areas, it's very hard to get rid of them. Thankfully, unlike uh, TBEV, the other virus we're going to mention here isn't actually in the UK, but there, the risk of it traveling here is increasing. We wanted to mention this virus as it, it is a great example of how dangerous some tick-borne viruses can be. Um, this is Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, um, and it is transmitted um, primarily by hyaloma ticks, um, and it uh, can do animal to human and human to human transmission, which has been recorded. Um, this virus has a case fatality rate of 30 to 50%. And unfortunately, climate change has expanded um, the geographical range of the ticks, meaning the risk of coming across these diseases is ever increasing. Um, these viruses are only ever handled in a high, the highest containment laboratories because of the risks they pose. Um, most cases of CCHF in Europe are uh, brought in from further afield. For example, in 2012, there was a case of um, 
CCSF from a man who had traveled from back to Glasgow from Dubai. So the symptoms of CCSF include a range of symptoms from a headache, high fever, stomach pain and vomiting, but also red eyes and flushed face and jaundice are also common. But in the case of later stages of disease, there can be changes in um, mood, um, sensory perception, um, progressing further to bleeding problems. But in the long term, the effects um, have not been well characterized or well studied. Um, but the recovery is usually slow and patients are rarely get back to normal. So as you can see, um, the distribution and, and dates shown on the board, CCSF has been gradually moving its way towards um, from Eastern countries such as Russia, Turkey and Iran, which are quite badly affected towards the West, with the most recent cases being um, two human deaths in Spain. Okay, so now hopefully we haven't um, scared you too much as, um, as we've said, the pathogens we've talked about are usually most likely to cause mild disease, which will clear up even if it requires treatment or, if, or haven't quite hit our shores yet. But the, it's important to be aware that ticks can carry risks and to know how to minimize your risk of tick bites when enjoying our beautiful Scottish countryside. So now we're going on to the bit that probably everyone's very aware of, but we're going to repeat it anyway. Um, and that's the advice on dealing with ticks when you're going out and about. So the easiest and um, most like easiest way of not getting bit from by a tick is to not give them access to anywhere to bite. And to do this, you can wear long sleeve tops and long sleeve trousers and do the very fashionable look of tucking your trousers into your socks. If you do unfortunately happen to have one um, get onto you, wearing light colored clothing means you're way more likely to actually spot it and be able to brush it off before it hunkers down. You can also use um, different insecticides. So we have DEET, but there are other um, anti-insect sprays and things that you can actually put into your clothing, which will last a few more washes like permethrin. It's always a good idea to have a look around because some of these may be better suited than others. And additionally, you can also get things for your vet, uh, for your pets. But again, ask a vet because there are certain species which are a bit more sensitive to certain types of um, insecticides than others. And finally, it's important to make sure you check for any unwanted guests at the end of the day, because despite all the best attempts, and if you stay away from long grass where ticks quest and you cover yourself head to toe in bug spray, they're quite persistent. Um, and so the best thing to do is to make sure that you get out of your clothes when you get home and bung them in the wash, and then do a full tick check to make sure there's, no, there's none which have managed to grab on. Because unfortunately, Ticks like to go for the easiest, the path of least resistance. Um, and that includes for us the more delicate parts of our skin, such as between the legs, the backs of the knees, in the elbows, under the arms and inside the belly button, which is the one that always makes me cringe. Additionally, um, they tend to go for places where they can grip really easily. So they will sometimes go for in and around the hair where it's easier to stay attached. But even if you have been bitten, don't panic. There are a couple of do's and don'ts. We're going to go through the don'ts first. Um, the first one is do not sanitize the bite site before removing the tick. And this may seem a bit counterintuitive, but that's because hand sanitizer, alcohol, Vaseline, anything you can cover a tick in, it will eventually kill the tick, but that's not because the tick drowns. It's because the tick will not be very happy. Alcohol, Vaseline, covering the tick, they're all irritants. And when you expose a tick to an irritant, it's more likely to regurgitate its stomach contents into the bite, which massively increases the risk of transmission of anything it could be carrying. So the next don't after that is don't try and remove the tick with your fingers, no matter how small your hands may be. You don't really want to risk detaching the head from the body and you don't want to risk popping the tick and then having whatever it's carrying spread out everywhere. And also it's kind of just a bit gross. Um, in addition, once if you don't try and burn, poke or crush the tick, especially when it's still attached and try and make sure to dispose of it safely and don't delay in trying to remove the tick. Obviously, if you've not got anything to hand and you don't really want to try removing it, you can wait till you've got the appropriate tools. But once you're in a place where you can take the tick off safely, don't hesitate. There is a urban legend that if you remove a tick before 24 hours of being bitten, you won't catch anything it's carrying. Unfortunately, this is a myth, but if you do remove the tick sooner rather than later, you do minimize the chances of, carry, of catching whatever the tick has. So on to the do's. 
Do make sure that you remove a tick using a suitable tool and an appropriate technique. There are lots of tools available now, um, and we'll show you a couple on the next slide. But when we say appropriate technique, what we mean is grabbing the, as close to the head as possible and gently pulling in one direction um, and not kind of jamming it about and not being too rough because you don't want to risk detaching the head from the body. And then once you've um, remove the tick, that's the time to sanitize and make sure that everything is clean and safe. And then beyond that, just making sure that you're checking and you're making sure you're feeling okay. And if for any reason you're starting to feel unwell after a tick bite, going to the doctor. And then as we've said again, just change your clothes and wash them after a hike or an activity in case the tick that bit you brought any friends along. Oh, and also if you do get bitten, Quite a few vets and doctors now recommend to take a picture of the tick if you can't keep the tick in a sealed container in order to, if you do feel ill, have a check and to see whether they can identify the tick, which will narrow down the possibilities of what it was carrying. So as we've said, there are quite a few tick removal tools. You can use squeak tweezers if you're in a bit of a pinch, but we prefer using things like the tick card or the specialized twisty ones for your pets. They're a lot better because they're designed to help gently remove the tick to minimize the chance of the head being detached from the body. And then once you've removed it again, we're just gonna keep saying this because it's always important, see your GP, especially if when you've removed the tick, there's part of the tick which still remains in the skin or not all of the ticks removed because that also increases the likelihood of an infection. And if you feel unwell at all in the 30 days following a tick bite, in particular, if you develop a rash around the bite site. So have you all been paying attention? Well, now we're gonna quiz you. So our first question is, true or false, ticks are insects? Give everyone a couple of, couple of seconds. You do a thumbs up for true and thumbs down for false. Let's see. Yeah, oh. you see false in the chat. Yeah. False, yes, you're right. Next question, can you name at least two of the life stages of a tick? Have you lost the chat? Where's the chat? Okay. Okay, good. Oh. Okay, yeah. Rebecca, Nymph, Egg, yes. Julie, oh, everyone, everyone's one. Egg, yeah. Oh, yeah, we got it. That's, yeah, that's it. So, Egg. Larva, nymph, and adult. Yes. So another question: What should you not do if you've been bitten by a tick? You can only put one of the bits of advice if you want. You don't have to list all of them. Scream. <laughs> <laughs> I like that answer more. <laughs> don't delay. Yes, yeah, sanitize before removing. Sanitize. I mean, you're welcome to scream as long as you do the other things as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, don't sanitize the area before removing the tick and don't use your fingers, burn, poke or crush um, and don't wait before removing. Last question, how much can a tick expand during feeding? Everyone's on Ryan it. Is, it. Yeah, everyone's Jeez. on it. Everyone's been listening. Everyone's been, I'm very <laughs> impressed. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. 200 times. Yep, yeah, well done everyone. So just to summarize, um, unfortunately, yes, uh, tick-borne disease is a growing th threat in Scotland, um, but the risk is still very small. Please don't let this um, put you off enjoying the wonderful Scottish countryside. Um, but remember, uh, take precautions that we've mentioned, and if in all doubts, please see a doctor. Um, but while uh, you're out and about hiking and out for a walk, um, if you come across on your travels, um, a tick, we kindly ask that you take a picture of it and note of its location and uh, send this to us either through our cool Twitter page or um, to our email. And uh, we'd like to thank everyone um, that has been involved in this work at the MRC University of Glasgow Centre for Virus Research, including the Brennan Lab, the Colag, Pondville Labs, and uh, the, our public engagement team. Um, we'd also like to thank our collaborators in Liverpool and over the pond in Hanover. So if there's any questions that we don't manage to get around to now or there's anything else you'd like to know from us, please do feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you guys. But yeah, thank you very much for listening. And I think we're about ready for questions. <laughs>